Okay. Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Nestor Castaneda, uh, an associate professor of Latin American political economy here at the UCL Institute of the Americas. And it is an absolute, absolute pleasure to, to, for me to introduce Professor Blofield today. Uh, she's going to present a paper entitled The Politics of Social Protection During Times of Crisis, COVID-19 and Cash Transfers in Latin America. Professor Blofield is the director of the Institute for Latin American Studies at the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. Uh, she's, also, she's a well-known scholar of governance and public policies policy issues in Latin America. And she's also well known for her excellent work on policy areas that include social policy, gender issues, labor policy, health, and family policy. Professor Blofield has published many books and articles, including two that I really, really like, Care, Work, and Class, uh, which is a, a book on domestic workers in Latin America. And, and, and another book that is, I think now, uh, uh, like, like, a, like a crucial book for the scholars on inequality in Latin America, which is The Great Gap, Inequality and the Politics of Redistribution, Redistribution in Latin America. Her current research focuses on the policy cha challenges produced by the COVID-19 pandemic on social protection, family policies, and domestic violence. Professor Blofield, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It is a, a pleasure to have you here, here uh, at the institute, uh, and, and to have you to, uh, to have you as, a, as as our first speaker in our new uh, uh, seminar series on democracy and governance in the Americas. So, without for any further delay, please join me in welcoming Professor Blofield to the institute. Uh, she's going to be. Uh, she's going to talk for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then we're going to open the, the we're going to have some uh, comments from Professor, Professor Molino, uh, and then we're going to open the floor for questions and comments. Thank you very much, Professor Blofield. Thank you. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to well, be in London, and hopefully one day I can actually be there uh, physically, but for now, greetings from Hamburg. Um, and thank you so much for the introduction. And I will, I'll, I'll just launch into have a PowerPoint, of course. <laughs> and um, I <clears throat> understand that you shared the, the working paper we had on the, the kind of the breadth and sufficiency of cash transfers. And I will, I'll, I'll kind of present that as well as um, the theoretical framework. Basically, I present, uh, um, uh, we have a short monograph draft uh, with my two co-authors on this topic. Assessing the breadth and sufficiency of cash transfer responses in Latin America and and um, explaining uh, them. So, if it's okay, I will. Can I share? I can share. Excellent. There we go. Share, and it's working. So, okay, yeah, the ubiquitous question. Does can you see my screen? Okay, so the the working title of our our. Uh, monograph draft it's a short one it's like between an article and a book it's basically i think we're at thirty-five thousand words and um we're uh submitting it for review at the cambridge element series hopefully very very soon uh but in that sense also feedback would be extremely appreciated um so the the title is the politics of social protection during times of crisis covid19 and cash transfer policies in latin america and it's a co-authored work jenny Preble was unable to attend because she had um uh, she's hosting a panel right now on chile and um cecilia Gianbruno uh, in uruguay is um uh, at another panel as well but i'll, I'll present on all of our behalves uh, so very briefly, and this won't be anything particularly uh, new to you, uh, but the pandemic toll in Latin America uh, has been, well, it's been terrible around the world, but Latin America has relatively taken a especially big hit uh, uh, related to the high inequalities, labor informality and urbanization, which caused difficult conditions to contain uh, the spread of COVID-19. And here you can see, in our book, we assess the response during the first full 12 months. 
Okay, and so also these numbers here are for the first 12 months of the pandemic, although they haven't really changed. You, you can see here uh, by end of last April, uh, you have here the share of Latin America, share of the global population, the share of global COVID deaths. And so it has um, had much higher than its share population-wise a number of deaths. Economically as well, uh, the hit for the region of Latin America was worse than it was relatively in other regions of the world. And the recovery is expected to be, well, ha you know, it's, it's expected to recover, but still, at lower levels than other uh, regions of the world. And within this context, the intervening role of social protections has been an issue probably, well, maybe it's exaggerated to say uh, an issue of life and death, but not that far from it uh, for uh, all the people who had to shelter at home or who lost their jobs and um, uh, had no savings or income to feed themselves with. Okay, so what we look at uh, is these social protections and we specifically look at cash transfers. And of course in Latin America, um, well, there's broadly three groups of households uh, that, well, if we go back to March, 2020, okay? There were three groups of households. Governments were faced with this sudden unexpected crisis. Uh, and in fact, Latin American governments moved rapidly to institute lockdowns. Actually, they were very rapid about it. They saw what was happening in Europe. And, you know, obviously there were instances like Bolsonaro who didn't, you know, care, but like overall the, the, the responses even, and also in Brazil on a subnational level were rapid in terms of lockdowns. Um, and of course, with those lockdowns came, uh, uh, the sheltering at home was, uh, well, if you were in the formal sector, you could probably find a way, you know, that your income might continue, but it was very problematic for all the folks that were uh, uh, making their income through the informal sector when you had these lockdowns. So there were three groups of households that governments had to reach uh, rapidly uh, to ensure their uh, well-being during this exceptional time of crisis. Those in traditional contributory social security, so those who are in the formal sector, then uh, who were overall depending, you know, half the economically active population in the region is not in contributory social security. Uh, and especially families with children are not. So the actual population that this contributory social security reaches is, is even lower. Those in, then the other group was those in non-contributory social security. So like, it's, you know, uh, non-contributory pensions, CCT programs, especially. And then what we ended up calling was this informal households, so basically households that fell in between both groups. We, um, with uh, Cecilia Fernando Filguera and I, uh, when the pandemic actually hit Latin America, we, we started immediately collecting information on government responses in real time. Uh, uh, and we expanded it finally to 10 countries uh, in those first months. And we published the reports, just the descriptive sort of responses of, uh, by governments to these three house groups of households. Um, in an ECLAC uh, study uh, exact, exactly a year ago. Uh, on the basis of this 100 page death by detail document, we then moved uh, to, uh, we extended uh, our analysis of what governments were actually doing, the duration, but we were also, we found such massive variation, we're very interested in uh, understanding what was driving that variation because it didn't intuitively and according to some of our existing theories make uh, sense. <clears throat> so what I present today and what, what you read on is that we, we kind of hone it down. We, we had to find ways to compare uh, the government responses uh, in terms of breadth and sufficiency um, uh, across countries, like kind of standardize it. And what we did then, uh, and what you read, if you, if you read the working paper is we look specifically at national level cash transfers to two groups. Uh, first, recipients in existing CCT programs, so conditional cash transfer programs, so basically families with children in poverty or extreme poverty, and then the group of informal households uh, that became a target of government policies because they were the ones who were uh, left without uh, income with all these containment and social distancing measures. Uh, the reasons we narrow it down to these two groups, 
was, well, first, group one is better off. Uh, and the policies toward this group are very heterogeneous, very, very. And we, we document that heterogeneity in this uh, CEPAL document, uh, uh, also because, you know, they had different labor codes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, group two, uh, children, the elderly were epidemiologically most vulnerable with COVID. Children were by far socially most vulnerable. About half the children in the region live in poverty. The corresponding figure for those over 65 years is uh, 15%. So we were interested in how they basically targeted these two particularly vulnerable groups. Also, the other informal households, uh, 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 low-income households are uh, very likely about, in the lowest two income quintiles, um, about 70% of households have children. When you go to the up, uppermost income quintiles, we're looking at something like 20%. And so there's a huge difference. Like Poverty is really concentrated in low, uh, income informal households. Okay, so here are the results. And we can talk about all the methodology. Um, for We look at here, cash transfer breadth in Latin America. Uh, figure one, it's the evolution of coverage of existing cash transfer programs to children before and during COVID-19 in 10 Latin American countries. So to be able to compare uh, the breadth of coverage, uh, we uh, basically measure the number of children receiving these transfers as a percentage of the total population under 18 years in each country, okay? Uh, and the dark blue line is pre-COVID coverage as of 2019. Then uh, the green here is peak coverage during the crisis uh, as percentage, same percentage of population. And then the light blue one is coverage as of March, 2021, which was a year after the crisis or you know the date that was as close to it as possible. There are two countries, uh, Mexico, no, actually only Mexico that didn't have, uh, only had, they're basically not transparent. They don't, they don't have data on this. And so this is, there's no variation here because we only had one data point. All the other countries have uh, variation. And so you can see there are some changes taking place. And surprisingly, like in Colombia and Costa Rica, coverage declines during this crisis. Then there's cases where in Bolivia, it jacks up and then it declines again because it involves an emergency transfer to children. And then you have other countries like Ecuador where it actually climbs up significantly. We don't have the data point here in the middle, but we can see from here to here that there's a significant increase in coverage. But overall, you can see that there isn't such a huge impetus to extend, uh, like ex expand coverage during this crisis. Here is where you see the major new program development uh, in terms of emergency assistance towards these informal workers and households. And in figure two, uh, how, how we measure this. So this is peak coverage in these new emergency cash transfer programs in relation to total and informal employed population uh, during the first year of the pandemic. So the um, green graph here is, um, uh, basically, the 100% the here is the total employed population in each country, okay? Uh, so then we calculate the number of recipients in these new cash transfer programs, and then we measure it as a share of the total economic, uh, employed population uh, in terms of the most recent available data per country. And so then we come up with a graph. So in Brazil, for example, just under 60% of the total employed population in the country received uh, emergency cash transfer uh, uh, during COVID. <coughs> then we have this kind of as a <coughs> proxy, fun proxy for need um, <coughs> is, uh, sorry, the red line is the share of occupied population that <coughs> are informal. So those are the people who really need coverage because we can assume that the people who are formal, they're being targeted to other programs, okay? Uh, so you can see basically what this tells you is the closer the green graph is to the red line, uh, the more the governments are likely to be reaching the population that needs these transfers. 
Okay, uh, and in some cases, uh, these the the programs are even bigger, like in Brazil. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean an error of inclusion. In Brazil, for example, they included mothers uh, who are not necessarily in the labor market, uh, uh, but other like a broader vulnerable groups. Okay, this also doesn't tell you anything about whether the targeting is perfect. Okay, this is just. A measure, aggregate measure, we can get into discussions of that. We have data on it, but this is not measuring that. We, we, but that requires a ton of impact evaluation kind of studies, et cetera. But you can see that there are a lot of countries that have massive new programs uh, that are reaching the populations, uh, a large share of their populations. In Peru, uh, just to Peru, the program is actually very broad, but they give only one transfer per household. Uh, so here it looks smaller. If you calculate the indirect beneficiaries, then Peru, sorry, Peru's coverage is actually uh, much higher. What you see here is that the first seven countries uh, create uh, broad programs uh, uh, to cover the increased need. Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, sorry, Ecuador and Colombia uh, create programs, but they're much smaller in breadth. Uh, and this is actually uh, because the first seven programs, they create demand-driven programs where they basically allow individuals to self-identify and uh, apply, then they can still restrict um, or, you know, they can cross it with other databases and decide somebody's not eligible, but everybody can apply. Ecuador and Colombia create programs, but they use existing databases, basically, uh, don't call us, we'll call you and the coverage remains very restricted and then Mexico creates no new national cash assistance program <clears throat> at all in response to COVID. Okay, here is the same two groups, sufficiency of cash transfers. And what we do here is uh, these are measured uh, uh, as a, a share of the national urban extreme poverty line from CEPAL data latest available data, which is 2019, uh, uh, per country, uh, divided by four, because we're basically here assuming a prototype of a four person household, two adults and two children, which is actually co relatively corresponding to you know, the size of a household in lower income sectors. In our CEPAL study, we also have one that is like single parent with more kids. But this is basically so, and this, this enables us to uh, standardize these measures across countries, right? And we also assume some more specific things like they're school aged and so on and so forth. Uh, so here you see basically, and we calculate this information across the first 12 months. So the red line here is uh, extreme poverty line. Uh, you can see the blue graph is pre COVID. So basically, sufficiency is very low in all the countries, except for Uruguay, uh, uh, pre COVID. Uh, and then it shoots up. Uh, in seven out of these 10 countries, uh, governments increase the sufficiency of the cash transfers to, through the CCT systems. Uh, in Ecuador, uh, Costa Rica, Mexico, they do not. Then on the other side, uh, uh, the other table is in the new emergency assistance programs and you see uh, exactly the same uh, measurements uh, and you see how that plays out there. Mexico is not included because it doesn't have a program. You can also see, for example, Brazil and Chile, they create these broad umbrella bro programs uh, for both types of transfers and other countries keep them strictly separate. But what you can see here is that the variation in both breadth and sufficiency is significant. And finally, then here, we categorize them for our analysis uh, in terms of breadth and sufficiency. Uh, and what we see here is a category where there's two countries with high sufficiency and high broad coverage. Um, and we're calling sufficiency, of course, it wasn't high, it basically met extreme poverty line per capita, okay? We can, you know, some, we were suggested, somebody suggested to us last week that we call it adequate sufficiency or maybe, you know, some other term and, you know, we're open to that. Um, then we have this category of mixed sufficiency uh, and we can even include Bolivia there, which like is low sufficiency. And so in these countries, for example, in Argentina, sufficiency started high and then it plummeted because the government ran out of money. Uh, in other countries, you had higher sufficiency in one type of program and a lower sufficiency in another type of program. 
Uh, so basically, there's a lot of variation here. But the key with this group is that they had broad coverage. Then there's kind of a hard break uh, uh, with uh, countries with much more restrictive coverage. And there we have Colombia and Ecuador. Their coverage is restrictive and the sufficiency of the transfers are low. And then you have Mexico that has its existing program, which is new under AMLO, uh, uh, but uh, no additional programs and no increase in sufficiency. So we have these basically four categories that emerge from here. So our theoretical framework, how long have I been talking for? <clears throat> Don't, don't worry about the time. Just... Okay, okay, I won't. <laughs> no. Okay, so our theoretical framework uh, is uh, the following. To uh, explain uh, this outcome, uh, we focus on four variables. First, the perceived political costs of inaction of the political leader, the president, for the president. Two, programmatic left party legacies. Three, fiscal space. And four, mediated by divided government. Specifically, we argue that the high perceived costs of inaction help explain why or whether presidents felt pressure to respond socially to the COVID-19 crisis. Once executives were motivated to respond, they pushed for and adopted programs that varied widely in terms of breadth and sufficiency. We contend that this variation is explained by the presence or absence of programmatic left party legacies and fiscal constraints uh, in combination uh, with divided government. So we'll, I'm gonna walk you through how we conceptualize and operationalize these variables in the next slide. And that's actually kind of the last slide um, of the presentation. Uh, but we also rule out in our manuscripts on competing hypotheses, especially that the ideology of the president per se uh, is key. And then the variable of state strength. Um, uh, and with the variable of state strength, we've actually thought about that a lot. And uh, we, we take state strength into consideration, but it's interesting, we don't find any evidence that state strength has influenced the breadth and sufficiency uh, of the benefits. Where we find that the variable is important is in determining the speed of policy implementation. In our initial ECLAC study, we also looked at speed. We looked at speed, breadth, and sufficiency. So in other words, we uh, find that the decisions to issue and expand benefits were political rather than constrained by technical capacity then how fast the government was able to get the cash into people's hands after establishing the program was influenced by state capacity. And that's an additional chapter now that we're working on uh, in our manuscript. Okay, so here we have a summary of our theoretical framework along with a rough description of how each country looks uh, on each of our four variables. So, okay, as I mentioned, uh, Previously, the first variable that we look at is the perceived political costs of inaction, and we operationalize it in two ways. First, as competitive political environment, and we measure this competitive political environment as the existence of national elections uh, in the next year, like by April 2021. Uh, and second, uh, strong civil society with mobilizing capacity. <clears throat> And where both factors are present, the perceived political costs of inaction are high and signaled here uh, with a double X. Uh, so we expect that in countries where civil society has strong mobilizing capacity, and here we're also like as evidence, like we measure it uh, in a variety of ways, but especially uh, looking at whether the wave of protest that hit the region in 2019, whether uh, the country had that wave of protest uh, in 2019, and then uh, whether politicians faced national level elections, if they had both present, then the perceived costs of inaction were high. And what we can see is that in all of the countries except Mexico, you have at least one or the other. And so we, we argue that this explains why we see some form of response in all the countries except Mexico. Then 
Once a response is on the table, we argue that these other three variables shape whether the response is broad and sufficient. The first here is the legacy of a programmatic left party. And we argue that left party legacies exist where a programmatic left party held power for at least two terms of office uh, between 2000 and 2019. And so all countries with an X on this variable met that condition. And here we can discuss because we, we specify that it needs to be at least a relatively programmatic left party. Um, and for example, the case of Ecuador, where we uh, argue that and, and I have, uh, I'm going to present this and then I'm going to end, but I have a table for how we coded each of these. And so if you want to, you know, get into the, those details, then I'm more than happy to, uh, you know, hear any feedback. Uh, so all the countries that have that X met that criteria. And in those settings, we argue that progressive policy networks were formed around the ideas of a basic minimum income and a social policy floor, like basic universalism. And these networks often existed both inside the state bureaucracy and in civil society. And especially they kind of germinated over time. And that's why the duration of the left legacy is important too. In the COVID-19 policymaking environment, these networks became very important because policymakers had to ask, act fast. They were in compressed time in crisis conditions uh, and draw on existing policy designs and frames. Where the programmatic left had held power and where these networks were strong, those frames involved creating policies that were broader and more sufficient. Uh, the second variable, uh, we look at uh, is fiscal space. Uh, whether or not the country had access to resources to finance the expansion. And so this comes from uh, growth, but also from an ability to take on debt and enjoy access to relatively cheap credit. And in the settings where fiscal space was limited, it was difficult to sustain those benefits. And finally, we find that these two variables, fiscal space and divided government, interact with, uh, sorry, these, sorry, these, uh, the programmatic left party and fiscal space, they interact with unified versus divided government to produce uh, a range of outcomes. For example, where left party legacies exist and there was divided government, and this was the case in Brazil and Chile, the opposition parties were able to push resistant executives to act in broader and more sufficient ways. Because it's quite interesting because the two most broad and sufficient countries uh, had right-wing executives when the pandemic happened. By contrast, where fiscal space was limited uh, and divided government existed, and here exa the examples are Ecuador and Costa Rica, uh, opposition parties used these constraints to hold back executives who actually tried to uh, uh, create broader and more sufficient uh, 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 social protection responses. So in our manuscript, we then go kind of death by detail and process trace to illustrate how these variables actually uh, take place over the year that we examine. Um, and, uh, and, and we do so for all 10 of our uh, case studies. So I, I don't present that here, but I'm more than happy to discuss uh, and whether you think this makes sense in these countries or not. And so, yeah, here we see the outcomes. And I also have tables on the coding of these variables. Uh, but I'll stop here uh, because I'm really very interested in hearing your feedback. Um, and uh, so thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a really, really interesting presentation. So now uh, Maxine is going to provide some preliminary feedback or comments or questions, and then we can open the room for questions and comments. Thank you, Maxine. Thanks very much, Nestor, and thanks, very special thanks to Merica for presenting your very impressive research. You've provided us with an empirically rich account of Latin America's policy responses to the COVID pandemic and a theoretically informed and methodologically rigorous uh, explanation of the great diversity in country responses. I think it's incredibly exciting research. So I'm looking forward to reading the final versions. On the first uh, uh, issue, the data, just a few general comments to draw in uh, many of the people who are participating in tonight's event into perhaps a broader set of thoughts about this. 
Latin America has not had a good press when it comes to handling the COVID-19 epidemic. Its infection and death figures, uh, as America has said, are among the highest in the world. And the responses of most countries, as we heard, were often late and less effective than many countries at comparable levels of development. And of course, this general picture of mismanagement uh, was very strongly color colored, I would say, by early reporting of quite shocking cases like Ecuador that were unprepared for the high number of deaths, couldn't bury their dead, and of the appalling shortfall in supplies, for example, the lack of oxygen in Manaus, Brazil, and in Peru, and the general lack of public health provision for the seriously ill. Now, America, your research provides a slightly more nuanced picture of a region that despite huge social sector deficits managed, if not to control the epidemic, nonetheless did place some limits on its negative social effects, most notably, as you show, by extending cash transfer coverage as the main safety net for the poorest, and in some cases by protecting employment by, for example, forbidding firms to sack their workers and other employment support measures. The fact that all countries in your study, and this is generally true, that's Mexico apart, this is generally true of the whole region, acted to uh, extend their existing safety nets in some way, and in some cases, uh, such as Brazil, actually increased the size of the transfer. And those measures have undoubtedly succeeded in limiting the economic hardship among the most disadvantaged. I would say including women who make up a large proportion of the disadvantaged through some quite active policies of support uh, by extending social protection to domestics, for example, but also uh, adopting strategies to help women who suffered high levels of violence and abuse during the pandemic, as in Mexico and some other cases, Argentina stands out here as a notable um, example. Yet many problems and questions clearly remain, which the pandemic has spotlighted. The very fragile social sector in many countries, the far from robust labor markets, high levels of informality, and a persistent average of 20% of the population in poverty. It's striking but not unexpected that despite the increase in social protection coverage uh, that the region saw in the 2000s, there's been little decline in poverty. It was 12% of the population in 2002 and it only came down a fraction to 11.5% in 2019. The hope I've often heard expressed is that the expansion of cash transfers that we have seen of late uh, will remain and not be rolled back. And if true, that marks a move towards a more inclusive universal provision for the poorest and should deal with the many targeting errors that cash transfer programs in Latin America suffer from. Targeting is often not only too narrow to tackle poverty, but it's also very efficient, inefficient, often leaving uh, as many as 50% of technically eligible households, the most vulnerable in other words, out of account. So this move towards greater coverage is very welcome and let us hope that um, it, it, it remains. It's, it's important to note that social protection programs in Latin America were kept deliberately parsimonious, that's to say thinly funded, partly for political reasons, but coverage was restricted in a variety of ways by admission ceilings and by targeting. But universal coverage will be far more effective in alleviating poverty. It does away with stigmatizing poor recipients and it doesn't cost that much more to implement, though it has met with resistance from the region's elites. I was actually surprised to see how low spending on these programs still was in 2017 at around 0.37% of regional GDP, a clear reflection of the very low value and insufficiency of most transfers. Uh, take the case of Bolivia, which is often praised and rightly for its programs inclusive coverage by targeted category, yet transfers among the, are among the lowest in Latin America and many others uh, are well below the minimum wage. 
Of course, Latin America really needs to move beyond depending on cash transfers to tackle its considerable social deficit and invest more in providing a broader social protection floor that includes the good health and educational provision that its majority populations badly need. The great variation in regional responses to the pandemic that America's research has drawn out is very striking and is due to many factors, size of the economy, strength of institutions, longevity of social service sector, and so on. And her ongoing research will tell us a lot more about the reasons for countries' successes and failures, particularly about the role of politics and governance and of policy legacies. The key variables, competitive environment, that's the political cost of inaction, progressive left party uh, legacies, fiscal space and divided governments, all point to the importance of politics, political capacity and political will, as well as to the strength of civil society activism in helping to shape outcomes. And all these factors are shown to have explanatory power in accounting for the response of the particular countries. As Merica shows, the cases of Costa Rica and Uruguay, for example, I thought were very striking for their long-standing consensus over the need for a social state. But Merica has corrected that by showing that actually that consensus is not the key variable. But also, of course, we have to mention in terms of fiscal space, uh, the commitment to public financing through taxation, because fiscal space is to a considerable degree dependent on how much tax can be levied on populations. As is well known, the tax systems that prevail in Latin America are regressive, not progressive, hitting the poor and the less well off and leaving the assets of the rich, money, poverty, lightly taxed if taxed at all in most countries. There are some exceptions. This underpins a very high income concentration in Latin America. According to a study by the World Bank, the richest decile of the population of Latin America earns around 48% of the total income, while the poorest 10% uh, earn only 1.6%. In contrast, in developed economies, the top decile receives 29% of the total income, while the bottom decile earns 2.5%. Not enough but redistribution matters. To conclude, it's been said many times that the most positive message of the COVID pandemic is the urgent need to attend to the longstanding problems that it has highlighted. Most evidently, as I just mentioned, these grotesque levels of inequality and continuing poverty and deprivation for many in a region that is not by long stretch the poorest in the world. There is self-evidently a need to build a new social contract, but I wonder whether, given the region's track record so far, if this is on the agenda. Perhaps, Merica, in your concluding remarks, you can reflect on whether this is in prospect. I will stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Maxine, for such an insightful comment on, on, on Merike's presentation. I don't know if Merike wants to respond to this comment or come. No, I, I, I'll keep it open and, and I'm happy to, yeah, hear other questions and then uh, speculate on whether we'll see a social contract. I mean, very briefly, well, I could say hopefully, they, they, but the story is not over. It's developing as we speak, but not certainly not in every country, but in some countries. I mean, there's some country specific dynamics going on on good. these issues. Very good. Okay, so uh, I'm going to open the, the, the floor for questions, but, but uh, and I would like to start with, 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 with a couple of questions about, about the I don't know, methods in the paper, because just because I'm curious about a couple of things. The first one is, 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 is about the, the issue of a state strength. I don't know why you use that term and not state capacity, or if that's on purpose or, or, or and, and, and why, and how state capacity plays a role in the whole theoretical and empirical model. Uh, uh, given the fact that in some way fiscal space and, and state capacity are in some way related uh, or correlated. So, so I, 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 I wonder if 
if you can expand a little bit on that, on, on the issue of state capacity or state strength. Uh, uh, and and uh, maybe maybe I missed that, but but basically you're describing a two stage model, right? In which you kind of explain the existence of a response, like government response. Uh, because of the first variable, which is uh, the, the cost of political inaction. Uh, and then once you have a response, you explain that response with the other three variables, right? Uh, programmatic, left legacy, fiscal space, and unified or divided government. So I wonder if you are planning or you're, uh, you're uh, what kind of statistical models are you uh, running in order to 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 analyze this data or, or, or this, this empirical empirical facts, but just just because I'm I'm, I'm curious about that, and um, and I, I think I mean I have a couple of two more questions, but I, I don't want to monopolize your your, your your time. So if you want, we can you can answer so right now, or you want to collect some more questions. Well, maybe if I can answer those just so I don't forget, uh, like okay. keep track. Yeah, I mean, the state, the, the, the state capacity, state strength, I mean, I actually have both in my notes. And Jenny and I, I mean, to be fair, Jenny's worked more on this. She's unfortunately not here. And so she she's better equipped to answer this particular question. But based on the literature, she was saying, well, we should maybe call it state strength rather than state capacity. But, I mean, uh, for my part, uh, like we might land on either uh, definition in terms of it, it is different than fiscal space. I mean, we have like, we code fiscal space really as kind of the access to money and uh, the access to money. I mean, Maxine pointed out, I mean, yeah, this is really, I mean, the next stage, like more broadly in terms of duration and social protection floor is whether uh, uh, we have tax reform in this country. So, right. Uh, but in the absence of tax reform and, they, and there were some governments that tried to implement tax reform during the pandemic because they had no money like ecuador and then he failed because the opposition in congress was like no way you know blah 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 um but uh so fiscal space and state capacity are different in state capacity we say doesn't really matter in this like uh the breadth and sufficiency of the response it matters in terms of if you have the databases to actually then deliver those benefits to the people and if you don't how fast you can build those databases and so here for example the Peru is an illustrative case because the president very quickly well not very quickly but mid no april 21st he announced that you know what like We've, we've gone around, you know, April 21st, uh, 2020. Uh, we've gone about this social protection thing in the wrong way for the last month. We've been looking into our databases to find the vulnerable. That's not gonna work because we're just like, we don't have the state capacity. We have to go and find everybody and then exclude those who have a salary. Uh, and then, but it took them like until mid-August to deliver those benefits to the last 2.5 million households because they had such low state capacity. And so like the program was there, the intention was there, the finances were there. And so we're looking specifically, I'm gonna say state capacity added in that speed or state strength, state strength versus state capacity. I'm, I'm kind of agnostic on that. In terms of your second question, we're not doing statistics. We only have 10 countries. <laughs> we're doing kind of a modest QCA here, you know, kind of like these routes to reform. If you have suggestions about how we can torture data when we have 10 cases, like <laughs> we'd love to hear it. <laughs> I mean, that's a problem, you know, like, because I, I, I like looking at countries and policy processes. And so then you always have like limited. And so we do process tracing and we do these tables, uh, but we don't have any stats. Yeah, 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 fair, fair enough. But it sounds like a, like a, one, like a, like a good setting for a two-stage model. I like that term. I was writing, I was scribbling it down when you were speaking. I mean, I'm, t that, that, I, I, I <laughs> it, is, it is in that sense, right? Okay, I don't know if the, someone uh, wants to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, uh, please raise your hand uh, and I can open the, the or unmute you. So please feel free to, to ask or your question or make your comments. <laughs> 
Anyone? Any specific question about the presentation or the topic in general? Carlos, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for that. I really, really enjoyed uh, both reading the paper and, and your presentation. I thought, um, as, Marie, uh, as Maxine was saying, that um, uh, it gives a, a, it closes with a more positive uh, note for for everything, or at least leaves the door open for for um, yeah, just this kind of transfers becoming or, or um, a, 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 a more or a long lasting uh, feature. But uh, I wanted to ask something uh, of the region, sorry, but I wanted to to ask some if if you could um, potentially like elaborate or or if if in terms of uh, subnational. Um, uh, governments, particularly in in in, in federal systems, um, and the role that they might have played, um, I'm really interesting to uh, interested to see, um, or or yeah, what your thoughts were about, it, in, in particularly in the case of Mexico, with relation mm -hmm. to the uh, political, how did was it called, political cost of inaction variable, mm -hmm. um, because um, yeah, la, la, uh, in your uh, in the in the other paper, the policy expansion in compressed time, you you very um de uh, in, in very in a lot of detail um go through some of the of the actions that the state governments uh put in in in, in or, or or rolled in in Mexico, right? Sort of to um fill that gap that was left by inaction of on the federal level. But I was wondering if if that could also like or if that how that interacted in terms of political inaction. Did it like do you think it could have made it like less costly? Mm. Or, or because, yeah, like it, it, Mexico didn't have um, uh, national elections that year, but it did have them the next year. So right. I was wondering if, if, yeah. No, I mean, those are good questions. Uh, what you're saying, so you're saying that potentially subnational response could be an independent variable in explaining also the lower costs of inaction of the national government. And we don't have the empirical data. I mean, that, that, that's a possible hypothesis to assess that. Uh, the, to the extent that we looked at some of the subnational responses, we didn't do this systematically, uh, but when we were really following it very closely in the first six months, they were still pretty low, right? I mean, state governments didn't have the kind of money that the national government had, and the programs were pretty small scale. Um, uh, and then when you look, if you <clears throat> look at some of the like, uh, you know, this uh, encuesta de hogares like, reported by the UNICEF in September 2020, it found that 80% of Mexican households with children were not meeting basic nutritional requirements. So likely whatever state level responses were in place were not um, uh, nowhere near sufficient, uh, nor were they, did they have adequate coverage. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a fascinating question in Mexico because like, and, and we, we trace this and we, you know, we obviously we look at Mexico um, is trying to explain why Mexico had no response. And so partly it's the strategic explanation that, you know, AMLO came to power. He had an absolute majority, he had a very strong mandate all through. It, his support has never fallen below 50%. Um, and there we look particularly at the legacy. Well, Mexico didn't have that legacy of programmatic left party governments that had created certain expectations because also when you have these uh, left legacies, they've created expectations of social citizenship among the population, as well as um, sort of the social organizations and the state capacity, you know, the civil servants, the sort of networks, all of that, and the, those being part of the public discourse. Mexico, we argue, had less of that. Uh, didn't have that. And then the left that existed was kind of all of its oxygen was sucked out by AMLO, who kind of basically transformed um, the PRD into his own personalistic vehicle. And so then we look at kind of how he shut down any dissent, because, you know, where, where could opposition, like, it's, it's, in his case, 
uh, you know, and, and we finally, like we say, well, you know, we're actually not psychologists and it's, you know, like what, what happens in his head when he decides to sort of obstinately stick to his austerity agenda and not like update any information, maybe since decades, I don't know. Um, like that's more of a psychological thing. What's the interesting political question is why was there no, where were the protests? Where was the opposition? And so we look at the center right opposition they of course criticized him quite a lot, but not for the lack of sufficiency and breadth of cash transfers. They were criticizing him for clientelism and other things and like political, you know, use of, you know, all this, you know, different funding for subnational governments. You have civil society organizations and you have a case where a hundred of them come together and declare and try to present in the Senate, you know, a proposal for a basic minimum income, I think in July, 2020. So it's happening, but it goes nowhere and AMLO just shuts it out and AMLO basically just keeps reiterating Mexico is doing fine. Everybody's basic needs are covered. He goes to the UN and says that, and you know, the few newspapers that are criticizing him, then he demonizes them, right? He like attacks them, ad hominem attacks. Um, and then other, and, and then, you know, you have these agencies trying to analyze the transparency and say, well, you know, all the government policies are intransparent and then officials say, no, they're not. Uh, and so, you know, he has this amazing capacity to snuff out uh, any critique and get away with it. Um, and, you know, and I'm not a Mexicanist and we don't have a lot of evidence it, to an extent it's a hypothesis, but why does the population not protest? Like why, like they did in Chile and in Brazil, you know, they, they're just protesting Colombia, uh, you know, and, and one argument is that you don't have this legacy of high social expectations of what the government really should be providing for, for its citizens uh, that would have been fostered by sort of these governments that promoted basic universalism. Mexico had oportunidades and seguro popular, but they were kind of implemented more by technocratic outsiders under conservative governments than yeah, but that's one. If I just could like uh, one quick follow up, that was yeah. that came uh, came to mind when you were, uh, yeah, again, like going through the the variables. The closest thing that we could potentially like have uh, to a programmatic uh, kind of legacy. Not, it's not close at all. But it was Seguro Popular, right? Yeah. And yeah, I was really, really impressed, or yeah, shocked that it it it, it did not generate any more resistance from anyone the pop the right defended it but like very weakly and very like half-heartedly as you mentioned but yeah like you couldn't it couldn't have more common at a worse time like scrapping civil popular and then trying to centralize everything back into the within yeah. everything and how come did that didn't uh that would that seemed to have been the perfect like banner to rally behind in time in times of pandemic and it didn't happen yeah. so yeah um, yeah thank you very much are you studying mexico yourself I am, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, so, um, uh, my, my research is about uh, household workers in Mexico. Oh. So yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm very familiar with your work on. Oh, oh, on, oh yeah. how interesting! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, fantastic! Thank you very much, Carlos. <clears throat> uh, if you're mute, you're mute. I'm sorry. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for that excellent paper. Um, I really got a lot out of it. I really enjoyed your um, your presentation. Um, you said something that resonated me, which um, was about, uh, and the question is in relation to the logic underpinning um, cash transfers. Um, and you said um, that, that we need to find everybody. So the idea is that everybody is then included, um, but then that data is then used to select groups that are then further ineligible for for certain um, for certain um, state uh, state benefits and other services. So um, my question was really about who the, who who are those that are being excluded? So those who are either the ones that are not found on the system. I know that you talked about um, informality, but I wanted, wondered if you could kind of expand on that. Um, so who are those who are not on the system and not kind of being flagged up? And then also um, who are the ones who are who who are falling through the? It, are there other groups here that are falling through the gaps that maybe we're not we're not thinking about and, and that are being left behind uh, within these strategies? Do you mean now uh, in the new emergency assistance programs or? Yeah. yeah, I think specifically what you mentioned in the in the uh, in your presentation and uh -huh. the specific, um, yeah. 
because there was like the reality pre-pandemic and then there was all these new programs that came into being right yeah um, which caught a lot of the people that had were like had fallen between the cracks right and some of those people might not even have been poor before the pandemic but they didn't have savings or assets you know to carry them through the pandemic at least for more than a few months um so the programs themselves they all have their own eligibility criteria like if you know there's the ccts uh and their criteria vary uh, by country and if like well i don't want to pull it back up but like in in the graph i presented uh you know they're very, quite different going from a low of only 15% of the kids being covered in Peru to a high, very high in Bolivia. But as Maxine mentioned, pre-COVID, the transfer was an annual transfer that when you actually calculated monthly covered 2% of the extreme poverty line in a family of four. And so really, really, really minimal. Uruguay had the highest coverage and sufficiency because they had actually uh, measured it specifically to uh, cover like the extreme poverty line for children. And so then in our graph, because we include two adults in it, it's lower. But if you're only looking at children, Uruguay is the one country that has high breadth and high sufficiency. Um, and so the existing criteria are very different by country uh, and involve all sorts of conditionalities that Maxine has worked on a ton. Um, then the new emergency programs, the seven that created these what we call demand driven mechanisms that ended up with broad programs, they were all, I would say they were relatively inclusive for nationals. I, um, uh, there, there's only, I think Uruguay and Brazil are the two countries that don't exclude um, even undocumented immigrants from uh, the, some exclude uh, non-nationals, some include legal residents, some, but I think, I think Brazil and Uruguay are the two that actually include, but I'm not sure about Brazil, Uruguay for sure. So, so you have that, right? So that's one uh, definite dimension is citizenship. Uh, but beyond that, if you look at them, you know, they, they really focus on income and so so they like look at like previous year's tax records if your income household income in the previous year was up above a relatively high threshold you know if they find that you're actually like in brazil you know <laughs> i mean it's kind of amazing what they did in brazil because they like they delivered these transfers to like 60 million people i mean that, that's a lot of people <laughs> you know and despite bolsonaro there were still some competent people in government who are like doing this, but you know, they also had lots of errors of inclusion, like they found like 140,000 military officials had applied for this emergency transfer and they had um, uh, <clears throat> gotten it. And then there was an audit and they found them. And, and so, but, but like in other cases, like those kinds of people were like in Bolivia, they, they, they looked at anybody who was a civil servant, uh, then got excluded when they applied, which is like, reasonable totally you know reasonable that's like an error of inclusion uh in terms of errors of exclusion i mean they're now doing studies looking at who are excluded and those for example in some countries those who didn't have access to the internet when a lot of this was going on over the internet then if you didn't have internet access it became a problem in practice that happened in many uh households in brazil because they were first entirely internet and then they created physical mechanisms of application you know rural communities in peru and bolivia uh, uh but in terms of the actual eligibility criteria, I would say that for nationals, they're relatively inclusive um, across these seven demand-driven uh, programs. Um, so there were no, like, they, they were all basically income-related. Then there's an interesting question here also to explore that has very much to do with Maxine's work and, and the kind of work that I'm doing now is looking at who gets the transfer in the household or is this is a transfer does a transfer target an individual and that's what they did in bolivia or a household which is what they did in peru and chile uh although in chile it was conditioned on the number of people in the household but it went to one person and then we can discuss the gender dynamics of that right um does that get it what's happening now these programs these emergency assistance programs are coming to an end when you had the second wave, then some of them started up again, and now they're transforming them into different kinds of programs. And so there's a lot going on on the ground now. 
and um, sorry so my underlying question was that the, the the overall strategy that you've seen in all of these programs is to blanketly include everyone as in to have everyone on a database yes then, yes and yes i mean because it, it wasn't yeah. right yeah. I, the, the criteria driving these emergency assistance programs was and i think rightly so households who had no income to carry themselves through the uh, crisis um, because of the social distancing measures and the associated economic crisis. What they're turning into now, the, whether there's conditionalities attached, um, that um, we'll see what happens. Thank you very much, Eve. Uh, any more questions or comments? from the audience. Please go ahead, Valerie. Well, hi everyone, I'm from Peru. So um, I wanted to ask this question based on, on like the contest I, I live with. Um, so my question was related to, in the new emergency assistance programs, um, I don't know if you uh, found a difference related to um, the poor rural households and poor urban households. Because here what happened, what happened a little bit was that the state knew how to approach to these rural households because they, the surveys they did had enough information to include them. And also from a long time, social programs and transfers were only focused on rural areas. So when the time of COVID came and they, have to, they had to include these uh, urban poor, poor households, they struggle, struggle a lot. Um, and I don't know if you find something like this in your research um, or in other countries maybe, because I think this difference is a striking, like it, it is uh, like a big difference here in Peru, but maybe in other Latin American countries, you cannot find it. Oh, so what you're saying is that the existing sort of ability to reach the population is much more heavily tilted towards the rural population than the urban, right? Yes, I mean, that's the case in Peru, right? And you probably, I'm sure you know Peru better than uh, we do. But when we looked at Peru, um, indeed, like these programs and like uh, Juntos and they, they, they were totally for, and, and, and when they started, then like once uh, Vizcarra, the president at the time, decided we need this sort of blanket program, it took them, I mean, they were, they were delayed in even issuing the executive degree by several weeks because they were trying to figure out what ministry can reach out to these people. Like it was a kind of a problem with the coordination and, the, and the, so the ministry the handled like, they ended up doing it with two different ministries, one for like for the urban uh, informals and one for the rurals, but, but you're right. Um, Peru uh, had this huge deficit in, information about its own especially urban informal population and also those 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 households were probably not the poorest households pre-pandemic you know uh, with Peru's economic growth they'd been managing uh, but then the pandemic came and and they were left without any income um, how that exactly played out in other countries I can't systematically answer that uh, but Peru stands out for the huge effort it had to put in to reach its population. Other countries were better prepared to do so. Now, Colombia and Ecuador didn't even do that, right? And so I don't know if they would have found it harder. Colombia has this system that the Colombians are very proud of. That, but for example, Colombia created this program, Ingreso Solidario, and they predetermined the number of recipients right from the beginning, like this is already in March, 2020, and it would be 3 million people, okay? That was kind of a, not exactly a drop in the bucket of need, but a very small portion. By June of that country, they still couldn't find 20% of those people. By the end of the year, they hadn't found all of them uh, because many people didn't have their data updated in suspend for various reasons, also related to conditionalities. And so you had a disincentive. So, um, uh, so if Colombia had tried to do what Peru did and it didn't, it could have faced similar problems. But I can't answer whether it was a rural urban issue. I, I frankly, I'm not an expert in that. And same with Ecuador. They, Bolivia had the ability to reach people because it did, as Maxine mentioned, it had these like more universalistic programs, right? 
they didn't use any electronic means. So it took them a long time. They had these long lines all through April, May, and June uh, because everybody had to go pick up their transfer, but they were able to reach the people faster. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, any, we have time for one more question. Uh, who wants to contribute to the discussion? If not, I have, I mean, maybe, I don't know, I can ask you, uh, very good to maybe provide some kind of concluding remarks, but I don't I see, Oh, I see a thumbs up, but no oh, question. That's Vicky. not a question. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Vicky. Hi, sorry. Um, I can't work out how to put my hand up. Um, <laughs> thumbs up instead. So I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you for presenting your work today. And I thought, because it hasn't been asked, I thought I'd, I would just ask, you know, um, we're talking about the politics of social protection. What about the politics of maintenance of social protection in Latin America? Because I, I kind of eaves, eavesdropped on your uh, Harvard panel back in March with Marcela Melendez and Alicia Holland. Uh, that was, of course, when things were, you know, still uh, very much, well, not more dynamic, but things were moving in a kind of perspective in a, in a different uh, time zone, as it were. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, I suppose, if we talk about fiscal capacity and fiscal space, there were, there were some questions about whether these, uh, uh, these policies of social assistance could, could eventually evolve into um you know more robust social protection in latin america and i just wondered you know maybe maybe you could comment on uh universal basic income which has been a kind of topic mm. in maybe Colombia, and maybe what 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 you see as the medium term view um i'm kind of lifting from melendez here but uh yeah the medium term view of tax reform and perhaps yeah. uh i suppose as a final question if i were to have a final question it would be something mm. like that you know looking yeah. to um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question to an extent. Well, I, I'm not going to do that cop out of where we've specifically systematically had to have a cutoff. And so we're looking at the first year. But I am following those debates. Um, you know, since last March, there's interesting developments. I mean, a lot of quite a few of the emergency assistance programs, like if you look at them over time, they, they, they've kind of come and gone like in Chile now. I mean, in March, Chile was providing less than it is now. Uh, like, and I think in Chile, well, also Chile has a presidential elections, constitutional reform. I mean, Chile is very likely going to end up with some kind of universal social protection floor. But it now has even more sufficient benefits than it did uh, a year ago when we were looking at where it was kind of topping Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, they also issued additional uh, transfers. Colombia maintained this Ingreso Solidario uh, uh, all throughout the time, but did not increase coverage. And in fact, I mean, Colombia, I just find kind of, you know, I find Colombia a little shocking. Then in the Familias en Acción, the coverage actually declines. Yeah. And this is by the government's own data. I don't think it's intentional. I think it's just somehow people are like, they're not updating stuff. You know, the, my favorite, I haven't done many interviews, but I got to interview Alejandro, Jenny and I interviewed Alejandro Gaviria when he was still director of Uniandes last February. Um, and we even presented this data to him. And, and, and um, you know, now he has, his platform is more inclusive. They passed this tax reform and including expanding Ingreso Solidario there. You see these, uh, you know, movements taking place. And so I think perhaps this persistence of protest opposition mobilization may result in something uh, more universal. It does have to come hand in hand with tax reform, unless, I mean, as Maxine pointed out, these programs are actually not so expensive. If they redirect public expenditures in other ways, like, you know, there's things like these awful cash subsidies in Ecuador, and, you know, you have these public sector servant pensions in Brazil, the, but the political will, it's extremely difficult to take away from people who have something, as we all know, politics 101. Uh, and so where does the money come from? And so, you know, you can borrow money, you can get multilateral assistance, you can, 
uh, print money, which is what Argentina did, or you can, um, uh, you know, have tax reform, reorient the public. So they have this like menu of options, right? Um, and and but you are seeing tax reform also discussed. I I, I think the responses are pretty heterogeneous. So I don't th I'm not sure whether there is a clear trend in the region. I, I think, in fact, that perhaps some of our very, I don't know, I, I want to continue studying this, maybe the variables we've found, uh, these programmatic left legacies and sort of social mobilization potential will, could explain some of the continued impetus for continued transfers, maintenance of transfers, as you say, uh, as well as the inevitable necessary tax reform that, that will evolve because the fiscal space in these countries is- That's really oh. it ties in a little bit to what uh, Nestor and I are working on, which is oh, yeah. the kind of general um, indifference that is perceived perhaps in, uh, informal groups and well suddenly there is this kind of impetus and how can ah. it be translated if you mean like informal workers are becoming more politically mobilized that's a question i'm not sure i have any real answer to but it would be interesting to see whether there is a kind of latent demand that's been spiked by um yeah a, a crisis like this yeah yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, all, all, all of you have mentioned, I mean, if you have any work that you'd like to share, please send it along. I'd be super interested. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank I'm going to minimize myself. Thank you, Degree. Uh, I, th I, th I think this is a, a fascinating discussion, uh, especially when you mentioned the issue of tax reform. I, 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 uh, I found it very interesting because at the end, I mean, you have like a double movement if you want, right? On, on, on I mean, you expand the so social policies uh, in order to, to to tackle the crisis, but then in the in the, in, in, in the following period, then you in, in the next period you need to you need to to pay for that, right? And most of these governments, uh, what are doing is uh, is to uh, they're trying to implement new tax reforms that could be very regressive in nature. And, at the, and, and so, 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 the, so the redistributive effect of this expansion of the social protection policies is going to be canceled by the regressive effect of implementing tax reforms that are probably based on the expansion of indirect taxation like BAT, this expansion of the BAT base or, or something like that. So, so it's very interesting to see how a social expenditure versus paying for that social expenditure is going to define uh, the effect of the crisis in, in for the social contract, if you want. That's interesting. I mean, I wonder, I'm not an economist, but do you think that expanding the VAT, if it was used to finance cash transfers, would still have a regressive effect? My, my hunch would be, does it wouldn't. Well, the, it depends on how they design the... Yeah. The, the 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 tax schedule, right? I mean, and who and who pays what, and what what kind of rates are uh, like implemented for different goods and services, right? I think I mean there's a big debate in 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 in, in economics in terms of I mean are these VAT uh, yeah. or or these indirect taxes actually <laughs> regressive or not? And it's like I mean there is no consensus around about this i mean from my point of view they're pretty regressive and and latin yep. america is an example of how mm -hmm. that kind of uh, tax instruments actually have a really negative effect on, right. on, on, right. on, on, right. on income distribution right right but the interesting thing is in a lot of countries progressive income taxes are on the table now as well yes so, yeah yeah Anyway, I think that it's time to, 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 to close the session. Uh, and I would like to thank Professor Brofield for such a fantastic talk and such a nice conversation. Uh, and also uh, Maxine for such, a, such an insightful comment on, 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 on Marike's uh, presentation. So thank you everybody for attending this, this, um, this uh, seminar series. And I hope to I see you later. And I hope that we can see Professor Blofield in person someday soon here in London. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Thank you, Maxine, for wonderful comments. And Nestor, also for both of you, for lots of food for thought and everybody else. It was a pleasure and an honor to join you. Thanks so much, Merrick. It was wonderful. And again, I very much look forward to seeing you in London. Excellent. <laughs> I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and have a, have a good night. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nestor. Mm -hmm.